Imagine flying over the vast Atlantic Ocean with nothing but basic aircraft instruments. No fancy screens, no GPS. Departing off the coast, you set course to the east. You know that somewhere over the horizon, eventually, will be your destination. But first, you must navigate thousands of miles of empty, blue, nothingness. So how did planes routinely fly over such vast distances before the luxury of GPS? The answer is multifaceted and brilliant. Stay tuned. In the early days of aviation, pilots primarily navigated using only one simple tool, their eyes. They'd use their basic instruments and visual references to determine their way. Mysterious concrete arrows laid out by the US Postal Service in the 1920s still exist in remote locations for this reason. As aviation progressed, however, pilots would need more tools to find their way, as they flew further distances at higher altitudes in varying weather. Besides, it would be pretty impractical to install hundreds of arrows in the middle of the Atlantic. A crucial development was the introduction of radio navigation aids. Non-directional beacons, or NDBs, moved the arrows up off the ground and into the aircraft, pointing pilots in the right direction towards a distant beacon. While the Very High Frequency Omnidirectional Range, or VOR, allowed pilots to intercept a track or a specific course called an airway, a highway in the sky. The VOR provided distance information as well, crucial for accurate navigation. There were still problems though. Utilising a beacon for navigation provided accurate information but still relied on ground-based equipment, and their range was limited only up to 200 miles at the most. Of course, you could, maybe, construct a line of beacons on man-made islands, much like the arrows of the US Postal Service, but that would be extremely expensive and impractical. So what really changed aviation would be a breakthrough, which allowed for a navigation system to be wholly contained within an aircraft. It was called INS, an inertial navigation system. It was a system which could track an aircraft's position simply by measuring the slight changes in acceleration, using accelerometers, gyroscopes, and a basic computer. And it was incredible. It effectively used the same principle that the earliest pilots used for navigation, dead reckoning. Except instead of plotting and calculating a position off a visual reference, it would calibrate with a known position. From there, its sensors detected and calculated each slight change in position and velocity to provide an updated position. In practice, this would be done at the beginning of a flight by a pilot inputting a known position, like the lat long of the aircraft's gate. From here, it could dead reckon the aircraft's position for however long was required. Pilots updating the position and the alignment either by cross-checking with available ground nav aids or with ground position fixes that they would spot on the ground. Whether it was for a flight over the country or over the ocean, no matter where the plane went, INS could be relied upon. As always, however, there were drawbacks to navigating with one single system. While INS had the ability to navigate independently, indefinitely, in practice, it couldn't. Because even a small error in the measurement of acceleration led to progressively larger errors in position. This was known as drift rate. As time passed between the current time and the last position input, it wasn't uncommon for aircraft to be miles off course after completing an Atlantic crossing. The INS could deliver it to vaguely the right position, but the aircraft had to rely on ground navies to complete the journey. Its magic was really in its independence rather than accuracy over long distances. In modern times, INS is still used on larger jet aircraft, but in a slightly different way. INS, air data computer, and GPS measurements are all used to keep a plane navigating accurately, because modern aviation relies on planes to be able to navigate within a tiny margin of error, and the best way to reduce the margin of error is to combine multiple independent systems. <laughs> 